then, it's so it's like the Wild Wild West. I'm like, does Abraham Lincoln need to be here for this? Like, do I need to like get a sword or like a flag? Like, what's going on here? This is wild. Hi everyone, this is so exciting. This is my first video in a series of videos where I'm documenting our cabin build journey. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to watch me crash and burn. Just kidding. Hopefully. If you're new here, hi, I'm Erin. I'm a freelance video editor, documentary filmmaker, and content creator living in New York City with my husband, Michael, and our director of marketing, Olive. And we are building a tiny, tiny cabin up in the Catskill Mountains. I'm speaking into existence. This is happening. And I decided to document the whole journey from beginning to end so that if you ever want to build a cabin someday, you can learn from all the mistakes that we're about to make. <laughs> so first, I'm going to talk about how we discovered that we could even afford to build a cabin. Second, we're gonna talk about the cabin that we've chosen to build and where we found the plans for it. And three, I'm gonna talk about the first and most important step and that is how to find land. Also, if you wanna sign up for our newsletter down below, I'll give you some updates, talk about budget. And then at the end of this thing, I will send you a 100% free ebook with all this information so that if you ever wanna build a cabin, all the information is right there for you. And then hopefully if everything goes right, all of our followers will get a discount code for the opportunity to come stay at our cabin. So first we're gonna talk about why. So although I live in New York and I love being a city girly, there's nothing quite like being in nature. I always feel most like myself, most relaxed, most at peace when I'm sitting in a creek with a beer, by a fire, listening to the birds and the leaves rustle. Ah, peak foliage, Bon Iver's playing. Like, I want this cabin to feel like you are inside Holocene by Bon Iver. Like, I wanted to just feel like a hug, you know? Nature, friends, good music, good vibes, some IPAs, just hanging out. That is what we're working towards, my friends. I never even considered building a cabin. <laughs> I am not a DIY queen. I don't work in real estate. My parents don't work in construction. You know, I don't, like, I'm not handy. I work in the film industry. I work in documentary. I'm a video editor. And I give career advice to over 3 million people on Instagram and TikTok, so. There's that. This was not on the bucket list for my 20s. But then last year I was scrolling through Instagram and I came across this company called Den Outdoors. And I was like, what is this? Interesting. So Den Outdoors is like a relatively new New York based startup that sells modern architecturally stunning cabin designs. And they sell everything from A-frames to barn houses, from ADU to single family homes. And so what you do is that you figure out which plan you know you want, you customize it, you get a general contractor and you build your cabin. And I was just like drooling looking at all their designs. They were so stunning, but again, not feasible for someone living in one of the most expensive cities in the world. Like it's just not really something that I could do. I fucked. But then I went down a bit of a rabbit hole. I watched their YouTube channel, read their blog, researching it a bit more, and I was like, wait, this is actually something that I could do. So through my research, I realized that if I could just earn and save up enough money to put towards buying land outright in cash, you can use that as your like equity down payment to get your construction loan. And then I started watching like Rob Bilt's YouTube channel, which highly recommend Rob Bilt. Oh my gosh, I downloaded his budgeting spreadsheet, amazing. And we started watching like The Outsider and Bush Radical, all these people who were just like building cabins with their hands. And I was like, good for you, not gonna be me, I wish. I wish. Levi Kelly is another great account. He does like cabin tours of cabins on Airbnbs and they're always just so beautiful. And that's a great place to gain inspiration. You know, I started subscribing to like Dwell, Field Mag, Cabin Porn on Instagram, and they're all such fantastic ways to get like excited and inspired about this like new creative venture. So now I'm gonna quickly talk about what we're building. So when I was a kid, my family and I went to the Colorado Rockies to visit this A-frame that my grandfather built with his bare hands in the 1960s. He was an architect and this wasn't trendy or anything. He just thought A-frames were super cool and he built this like incredible A-frame. And so I've always loved A-frames. I guess it's in my blood. However, we will not be building one despite Den having gorgeous A-frame plans. And here's why. So I would love to one day have a big old A-frame. I think small A-frames are a little hard to do correctly because you lose so much square footage by kind of having the walls be slanted. So we wanted to definitely build something small since this is our first time building and we want all the mistakes to be smaller because mistakes cost money and we want the money to be smaller, basically just making everything less risky. But I do really want to build an A-frame someday, but when I do, I want it to be like a larger A-frame. So we've chosen to start with the Den Outpost. The Den Outpost is a tiny, tiny cabin. It's somewhere between a tiny house and a cabin. It's 325 square feet. It is 15 feet by 15 feet, but it is incredibly premium. So every single square inch of the Den Outpost is top notch. It's going to be a premium five-star cabin, 
Every last detail is just meticulously thought through. The design makes it feel bigger and like one whole wall is just a bunch of windows. I'm pretty sure that's like where all the budget goes. And I just think that's like so amazing. You know, when you go out into nature, you wanna be out in nature. So we definitely wanted to build a cabin that, that prioritized that aspect. We're trying to think of names right now and it's called the Den Outpost and it's gonna be in Cairo, New York. So we're thinking like the Cairo cabin, but that also feels a little too obvious. So if you guys have any suggestions for our cabin, please put them down in the comments. I need to crowdsource this because we need to name this thing soon. So now I'm going to get you up to speed on everything you need to know about that first step looking for land. I'm going to tell you right now, guys, no one listens to you until you have land. General contractor, architect, they're all kind of like, cool, you want to build a cabin. So does everyone else. But once you have land and you're like, no, I have literally a lot right here that like, it, it's like perfect for building. That's when people are like, oh, okay, like let's start this process. So long story, very short. Last January, we started our journey of kind of just driving back and forth to the Catskills, which is about two, three hours away from our apartment in New York to start looking at land parcels. And over the course of the past year and a half almost, we put down actually three offers on three different parcels and they all fell through for different reasons. So the first one, we just never heard back from the guy and we actually like heard in town that he sold it to a buddy. So there's that. The second one wouldn't budge on price and it was overpriced. I think it's still in the market today. So they are not budging on that price. And the third one did not pass a perk test, which we are going to be talking all about perk tests later. So before we get into anything, I want to talk about like these two big buckets when it comes to buying land. So the first route that you can take is buying like in a development or a subdivision. So anytime you're like driving through the suburbs of the US and you see like, like a bunch of houses exactly the same being constructed side by side, like that's a development, that's a subdivision. You know, usually you can like get a model home and you can customize certain things about it. That's like one way to like build your own house. But like in the Catskills, like the second property we looked at was actually a subdivision. So a developer went in, he bought a huge chunk of land and then he like went through the necessary processes to subdivide that out so that he could sell the individual plots of land. They got the proper permitting, they did all the testing. So that's why that land was like a premium price because they had already jumped through all those hoops. So you could start building immediately without having to like go through all that bureaucracy. But the downside to building in a subdivision like that one is like there might be an HOA fee. There might be rules to like the size and kind of house you can build because you're building like like in a new neighborhood essentially. So they're gonna have a say in like what you build, how you build, when you build, all that kind of stuff. The second way of buying land is buying just like raw undeveloped land. Like this is literally just land. You know, this is just like unimproved land. It's just some random seller selling it. Maybe it has like a dilapidated house on it or maybe there's never been anything on it. This can be obviously a cheaper route to go, but you alone are going to have to go through all that proper testing and permitting and all that stuff. So obviously, you know, there are pros and cons to either way. So let's get into my pro tips for buying land as somebody who just went through this whole process. But I do want to caveat that this is all in New York state right outside of New York City, prices where we are buying are much higher than the rest of the country. And it's also much more bureaucratic for reasons that I'm going to get into, trust me. But don't be discouraged by all of this. You know, if you're buying in like Montana or Colorado, like it might be a lot simpler, um, but this was the process for building outside of New York City. But if you're somebody living in New York and you're looking to build a cabin like we are, this is gold for you. Oh my gosh, if I had this video a year and a half ago, Tip number one is to know your budget and location parameters. So some people are just looking for land to have land. Like there are people up in the Catskills who just bought 50 acres just to have it. They want to go hunt on it. They want to go camp on it. They just want to have it as like an investment because they think the banks are going to collapse. That's fine. You can do that. If you are looking for land, however, to build a home on, there is so much to take into account. This process is not like buying a house. Buying land is insane because you go out and you just look at this grassy patch and you're like what am i supposed to be looking for and there's a lot you should be looking for so anyway you can change what kind of house you build what you do with the land but you can never change where that land is so we wanted to build a maximum of 2.5 hours away from our apartment we wanted to build you know somewhere with elevation you know that's the whole point of going to the mountains we didn't want to build somewhere like flat we didn't want to build in a like suburban neighborhood we wanted it to feel you know like you're in the mountains but we also didn't want to build in like kind of a rough neighborhood. Like sometimes you get out there and there's like country folk and it's like, they don't want you anywhere near them. And it's like, okay, well, um, I want to respect that. You know, we wanted to build somewhere that still felt really like private and quiet. So like this one parcel we looked at was like surprisingly cheap, but then you go there and you turn, it turns out it's right next to the byway. 
so you can hear cars going by the whole time. That's not something that you can tell online. But we also wanted to build somewhere that was so close to attractions, you know, good hikes, breweries, ski slopes, all that. And I specifically wanted to be within 15 minutes of a gas station and a grocery store. You know, we've stayed at places in the Catskills that just feel like a little too remote. It's like a little freaky. It's like, okay, what if something happens and they went wrong? Like we're not really close to civilization. So I definitely wanted to be close to something. And I'm happy to say the parcel we went with is not only within 15 minutes of a grocery store and gas station, it's within 10 minutes, five minutes of a cafe and even a CVS. So <laughs> luxury. No, seriously, that is luxury. Like once you get out there in the mountains, like it takes forever to get to things. So that is like a huge perk. Also another important thing, if you are looking to use your like equity in the land as your like down payment for your construction loan, you have to make sure that that land is worth at least 20% of your total construction loan. So construction to permanent loans are completely different than normal traditional mortgages. So instead of putting down like six to 12% for like a conventional loan, like a normal house loan, for a construction loan, you're gonna need to put down at least 20%. And at first that freaked me out. I was like, oh my gosh, we're gonna have to buy this land in cash and then put down another 20% of the whole loan. But as it turns out, at least with what we're doing, you can use your equity in the land as kind of like your down payment for the construction loan. And then while you're building the house, you pay the interest on that loan. So if you bought a piece of land for $10,000, good for you. If your construction budget is $400,000, you now need to find $70,000 in cash to put towards that loan. Also, if there's a mortgage broker watching this video, feel free to clarify anything that I'm saying because I'm sure you could articulate it way better than I am. But basically, you need to have a lot of cash on hand if you're looking to build a cabin. So we both spent the last year just working our booties off, working overtime, taking on so many projects. I had like three full-time jobs at one point. I was just working all hours of the day so that we could have that chunk of change to put towards our ideal land and therefore be our down payment. Tip number two, use a motivated local agent who knows land sales. So in the beginning, we were just looking ourselves online on like, oh my gosh, so many websites, Zillow, Land Search, Land and Farm, Land.com, Realtor, uh, Keller Williams, Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist. I was looking at like local things. I even got into the MLS directory at one point. I even joined a Facebook group and just asked around like, hey, is anybody just selling land? And somebody was like, hey, I think Bob has a parcel. You know, people were just like so nice. But then Zillow does this thing where it like automatically connects you with an agent. And so it automatically connected us with this agent, but she, okay, for context, this was in like the peak of last year when houses were just like going bananas and things were selling like crazy. So she never like really reached out to us or sent us anything. And she never, ever, we never met her. She never walked any properties with us. So we would just kind of like see parcels, drive up there on the weekend, you know, look at them ourselves. But it was really hard because you don't know what to look at. You actually don't even know where like the parameters of the land are. You can use an app called Land Glide and that will like show you where the parameters are. Otherwise it's really, really hard to know what you're looking at. So it was a struggle between, you know, having agents that weren't really helping us out and then like not really knowing, I mean, we know the cat skills like well now, but like at the time, like we were still kind of learning the cat skills and like, you know, we drive up there, spend our whole weekend looking at land, like, and then we put down three offers and they all fell through. Like it was just a very disheartening time, but it was also because we were being extremely picky. Like we could have overpaid for that one lot. You know, we could have went with that lot that we were so, so about, but instead we decided to really hold out and not put our money into something that we didn't, that we weren't absolutely obsessed with. So then this year, Den, we partnered up with them and they connected us to their kind of like go-to real estate agent partner in the Hudson Valley and Catskill Mountains called Hudson Modern. And our agent there, Daniela, was awesome. So she immediately got on the phone with me. You know, I told her what we were looking for. I have a lot of specific things that we were looking for. And she sent me quality parcels. We went out and we looked at them. Um, at this time, oh my gosh, guys, land was getting snatched up so fast. Like. Like same day it went up, somebody would buy it. So she would send me the things, we'd drive up there and she would walk the land with us and she would point out like, oh, you could put your house here. Oh, like this is wetland. Oh, you know, there's electric. And she would kind of show us like the, the parameters of the land. And that was insanely helpful. I wish that we had done that in the very beginning. And within a month, like we found our parcel. Oh my gosh, that lot was so perfect. And that was just such a good feeling and we're completely obsessed with it. And I will tell you more about a parcel later. I'm gonna leave that for suspense, but oh my gosh, y'all, we got a beautiful piece of land. Tip number three is to know what to look for. Oh my gosh, you guys. So there are three very, very, very important things you need to know when you're looking at undeveloped land. And that is septic, well, and electric. Your utilities. Get ready to spend a lot of time talking about poop. I'm serious, especially if you live in the New York City watershed. Aaron. 
What does poop, the Catskills, and New York City bagels have in common? Get your pencils out, I will tell you. <laughs> so when you're building on rural land, you need to figure out where your waste is gonna go, where your water is gonna come in, and how you're gonna get power to your house. And these costs could get really high, really fast. So if you're like looking to buy a parcel in town, you can, you know, probably connect their, you know, the municipal water and the sewage and, you know, the electric right there in town. But if you're looking to build a more rural remote land, you need to figure all that stuff out for yourself. So whenever you're looking at a parcel, always remember those three things, septic well and electric. How are we gonna get those? Let me tell you. First is electric. You need to think, do I have to bring electrical wires to my house? Depending on where the electric is, it can cost thousands and thousands of dollars. You need to ask, where is the closest electric hookup? Is there a panel on the property? Is it on the road? Is it a mile away? This is really important, but also if you're building somewhere that's like solar friendly, you can always just like stick solar panels on your house and that will probably save you a lot of money in the long run. But if you're like us and you're building in the woods and you can't really you know, do solar energy, you are going to have to figure out how to pull electric to your house. Next up is your water, your well. If you're building out in the country like us, you gotta get water the way humans have for thousands of years completely on your own. <laughs> so most people will do this by digging a well. You know, some people do like rain collection filtration systems, which is super cool, but most people do this by digging a well. And the thing about digging a well is that they'll bring in this giant, I don't know, drill to dig into the earth and you don't know how expensive it's gonna be because you don't know how deep they're gonna have to dig to get through the crust into the aquifer. So in New York state, like this can cost anywhere from 7,000 to $30,000. You also need to operate the wells. You need like factor in budget for like a pump and filtration system, heating, you know, all that stuff. But the cool thing is that you're not gonna have a water bill. Like that is the coolest thing about living kind of like off grid, I guess you could say. Like you're getting all of these things like from nature, collective community, you know, you're getting it from the earth and that's pretty cool in my opinion. And third is the septic system. Before this journey, I never gave much thought to where our bodily waste would go. And now I know more than I would like to admit. So if you're living outside of a municipal water system and you flush the toilet, where does it go? The answer is your backyard in a septic system. So a typical septic system, your water will flush from your toilet and it'll go into a holding tank and that holding tank will seep out into something called a leach field and the water will drain back down and naturally filter through Mother Earth and go down into the aquifer and then, and then eventually you'll drink it again. And that's actually a super cool scientific process. But not all land is suitable for this process. A lot of land is not able to naturally filter that. So if you put a leach field in land that's too moist or wet and it filters too quickly, you are going to contaminate everybody's water with your poop. We don't want that to happen. You have to have the physical space and the land has to be able to percolate the water. That's why we have to do a percolation test or a perk test. A perk test is where an engineer and excavator go out to your land, they dig a giant hole, they pour some water in it, and they measure how long it takes for the water to be absorbed back into Mother Earth. Depending on the speed at which it does this, your land will either pass or it will fail. If it fails, you cannot build a septic system there. Now, don't get discouraged, you can still build a cabin, but you're just gonna have to have like a composting toilet or like a porta potty situation. You just can't build a septic system. At least that's how it works in the Catskill regions because New York City gets their famous drinking water from the Catskills. That's why the bagels and pizza here are so good. It's all in the water. New York City drinking water is freshly filtered water from the mountains. I never knew that, that's so cool. I used to live in DC and I, fun fact, I did like a video shoot at the DC water treatment plant and DC like literally just fil human filters the disgusting water and then it becomes drinking water again and they just like put a bunch of chemicals in it. But New York, our water is straight from the aquifers of the Catskill Mountains. They literally come down in these giant pipes and just like go directly to everybody's taps. But that's why if you were building in the New York City watershed, so like the areas where New York City gets their water, the New York City DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection is gonna get involved. So they will have to oversee your perk test process to make sure that you are not contaminating millions of people's drinking water with your poop. So. So as a New Yorker, I'm like, sweet, this is awesome. You know, they have such strict rules around this, like they're protecting the mountains, protecting nature, you know, have the great drinking water. But as somebody who's just trying to build a little cabin, it makes the process pretty arduous, um, arduous to say the least. But again, it's okay. Nature is more important than my timeline. I will always prioritize nature. Must respect the mountains. And one more quick thing you need to take into consideration is a driveway. So driveways can cost anywhere from one to $50 a square foot. So if you're building out in the country where you need a really long driveway, 
that can rack up very, very quickly and cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And if you're thinking about, you know, making your cabin into a short-term rental, you need to have a really good driveway so that when Brittany pulls up with her girls to your Airbnb and their Honda Civic and they get stuck in a snow ditch, that they don't call you crime, you know what I mean? And not to flex, but when I tell you about the land that we spent 16 months waiting for, drum roll please. It has septic, electric, well, and a driveway already on the property. Oh my gosh, guys, when it went up, I like was like in five minutes in, I was like, we're buying that land. You know, I've moved so quickly on it, but I'm so grateful that we waited because now we don't have to go through a perk test figure out electric and dig a well. We don't have to do any of that. It's already all done. So if you can get land that already has a well, electric, a separate system, unheard of. It is unheard of. If you can get land that already has all of these things, you need to jump on that because that right there is not only saving you a ton of time, bureaucracy and headache, it's also saving you a ton of money. So I'm very proud of us for waiting a year and a half for the right parcel to come along. I'm very, very happy we did. Tip number four is to research local regulations. So it's really important to research the local laws of where you're building, especially if you're building like outside of your community or neighborhood, you need to get plugged in. For example, if you're trying to, you know, build your house and then rent it out for part of the year as a short-term rental, you need to know the local policies around that because some communities have rules against short-term rentals. I'm looking at you, Woodstock. Some communities will limit, you know, how small of a house you can build, what style of house you can build. And of course, you have to make sure that the land is zoned residential. That's very important. You can always look up the state tax parcel ID number to see like how it's zoned. I would go on the New York State GIS map and I would see that's like how I could see where land was zoned. But if you're the right real estate agent, they are going to do all this for you. Like I remember asking our agent, and I was like, oh, is this land, you know, is it zone 311? Is it, you know, residential? And they were like, yeah, of course. Like, we wouldn't show you land. Like, we know you want to build a house. We wouldn't show you land that's not zoned residential, you know? You know, they're not going to show me land that's zoned agricultural or commercial because then I would not be able to build a house on it. You're not allowed to. And also, like, get plugged into the hyper-local communities. Like, whenever we drove to the Catskills, I would grab a local newspaper, you know, I'd you know, chit chat with the people at the checkout line, you know, I'd go on the Facebook groups and I would just try to get like a feel for like what the general vibe is. You also need to make sure that like the property lines are accurate. There is like no easements. And if there is easements, like what you can do about it. You need to make sure there's no liens against the property. You need to make sure you have the proper deed. And that's why when you're closing in on property, you actually have to get a lawyer involved. It's like non-negotiable. You have to get a lawyer involved because Again, buying land is not like buying a house. It is so weird and antiquated. So you have to have somebody there making sure that all the T's are crossed and the dots are eyed. All the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. There, I, buy land is so, it's like the wild, wild west. I'm like, does Abraham Lincoln need to be here for this? Like, do I need to like get a sword or like a flag? Like what's going on here? This is wild. So if you're looking to build a cabin, let's wrap up here with the last five steps. So number one, buy your land, own it outright. No one listens to you until you own your land. Number two, create a budget. You need to know upfront how much you can afford to spend on this, how much you want to spend on this, and how much you need to have in the bank to begin this journey. Number three is to find a plan, a plan for the house that you want to build. You need to either go to like a general contractor or an architect to, you know, design a custom home for you. Or I love Den because they're kind of in between. They have these plans that you can customize and it's just a really seamless process. Also, I just want to add, like, if you don't want to do a, it's called a stick built home, like a home that is literally built with sticks. Just kidding. It's just like built from scratch. You can do a, like a modular or a prefabricated home, like a prefab home where they just bring it in on a trailer and like unfold it for you. Um, that's also totally an option. If you want to do prefab, you can save a lot of money. Um, you know, the only downside is that they're, they're not unique. You can't really customize them, but it can be like kind of a great little base for you to go in and make some interior changes. Number four is to find your partner. So general contractor, lawyer, broker, architect, all that stuff. And number five is to work with your you know, builder, architect, mortgage broker, lawyer, everybody to get that construction loan set up and to have everybody's expectations set about what the timeline is, how much we're going to be spending. And remember that you are the boss. If you are building the house, if you're the one putting the money in, you have to call the shots and make sure that you're not getting ripped off, that people are charging you correctly. And don't be afraid to ask stupid questions. These people are experts. A mortgage broker is an expert. A general contractor is an expert. An architect is an expert. You are not. You do something else probably. Like I work in the film industry. My husband's a designer. It's okay to ask questions. Don't feel like you're bugging anybody and don't feel like you're stupid. This is not your real house, but it is theirs. Psst, if you haven't subscribed so far, 
please do so now so that you can continue to support my journey and I can put out more videos. If you're signed up for our newsletter at the end of this, I'm going to be sending you a 100% free ebook detailing every single step of this process so that you have all of it in one place for reference in case one day you want to build your cabin. And hopefully if everything goes right, we will send you an exclusive booking link so that you can come stay at our cabin. In my next video, I will be doing a budget breakdown of our next section of getting the construction loan. So if you want to see all about our journey, please subscribe. And if there's anything else that you saw in this video that you would like me to elaborate on, please let me know down below and I can make a video about it. Thank you so much for watching. I'm so happy that you guys are here on this journey and let's go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.